This is me. And this is my fiance. Together we decided to explore a little bit of South America. In our journey we followed the rise and fall of past civilizations, each built upon the ruins of their ancient predecessors. Together with the myths and stories that held them together, we go and search for the meaning of civilization, both modern and forgotten. How do cultures in some of the world's most inhospitable landscapes create such amazing civilizations? Perfecting agricultural techniques and creating architecture unproducible even by modern standards. And just as mysteriously as they appeared, they vanished once they came, leaving behind no written record. Along the Andean Cordillera, through the Altiplano, valleys, and deep into the Amazonian jungle, we go and search for these answers. After Tiwanaku, we made our way up to Lake Titicaca and crossed over the Strait of Tiquina into Peru. From Puno, we got on a boat and traveled to the floating islands of Uros. Lake Titicaca is considered the highest navigable lake in the world and has a surface area around that of Puerto Rico. There are but few lakes higher than Lake Titicaca in the world. However, they remain unnavigable due to lack of depth. Today, on Lake Titicaca, you find man-made islands made of reeds, which are made very much in the same fashion their ancestors did generations ago. Descendants of the pre-Incan Uro people occupy these waters. Unlike their distant Ayamara cousins who occupy the mainland, the Uro people have adapted to life on the water. The Uru people make a living off fishing during most of the year, and during the winter months, when tourists flock to the islands, they offer boat rides, sell artisan crafts, and open their homes up to the interested. There have been several investigations inside the lake, which supposedly reveal colossal stone structures underwater, as well as offerings made by the indigenous people of the region. According to one historical source, some of the islands used to be inhabited by a mysterious race of white-skinned people. However, they were all but destroyed by invading forces. Lake Titicaca was the cradle of civilization to much of the Andean cultures that existed throughout South America. It was from this lake that the god Viracocha rose from its waters and created the world. It was also from these waters that Viracocha created the first man and woman, Manco Capac and Mama Okyo. Viracocha then gave a golden staff to Manco Capac and said that he should march northward that every time he would stop to eat, he must plant the staff into the ground, 
and where the staff would sink effortlessly, he was to build the Cusco, the navel of the world for the Empire of the Sun. It was also widely believed among indigenous mythology that Viracocha disguised himself as a beggar and traveled across the empire as a mystic, until finally departing into the ocean towards the setting sun. In a few of the legends, he is described as having white skin and a beard, holding a staff in one hand and a book in the other. From Puno to Cusco is about another 10 hours. Along the way, we come to a stretch of road known as La Raya, which is almost 14,500 feet above sea level, making it a little bit more difficult to breathe. One of the most significant archaeological sites between Lake Titicaca and Cusco is that of Rakchi. Inside the complex is what remains of a massive temple known as the Temple of Viracocha. Most of the temple and nearby buildings were destroyed by Spanish invaders in the 16th century. The remaining structures show the complexity of the more ancient bases for the support columns, almost as if they purposely left it unfinished. Masonry, such as this, may be easily comparable to that of Tiwanaku. The adobe construction was later built upon by the Inca, creating a massive temple complex. The closer we got to Cusco, the more evidence we began to see of violent civilizations prior to that of the Inca. Sacrificial mummies and decapitated skulls were a common practice among these cultures, including that of the Pucara. Another common practice was that of artificial cranial deformation, by which the skull during its infancy is elongated. This practice is found around the world, which in most cases signifies status or nobility among the community. 